Section One of Modern Love by George Meredith. Read for LibriVox.org by Lore. Sonnets One through Five. Sonnet One. By this he knew she wept with waking eyes, that at his hand's light quiver by her head, the strange low sobs that shook their common bed were called into her with a sharp surprise, and strangely mute, like little gasping snakes, dreadfully venomous to him. She lay stone still, and the long darkness flowed away with muffled pulses. Then as midnight makes her giant heart of memory and tears drink the pale drug of silence, and so beat sleep's heavy measure, they from head to feet were moveless, looking through their dead black years, by vain regret scrawled over the blank wall. Like sculptured effigies they might be seen upon their marriage tomb, the sword between, each wishing for the sword that severs all. End of Sonnet 1 Sonnet 2 It ended, and the morrow brought the task. Her eyes were guilty gates that let him in by shutting all too zealous for their sin. Each sucked a secret, and each wore a mask. But, oh, the bitter taste her beauty had. He sickened as at breath of poison flowers. A languid humor stole among the hours. And if their smiles encountered, he went mad and raged deep inward till the light was brown before his vision and the world forgot. Looked wicked as some old dull murder spot. A star with lurid beams she seemed to crown the pit of infamy and then again he feigned on his vengefulness and strove to ape the magnanimity of love and smote himself a shuddering heap of pain end of sonnet two sonnet three this was the woman what now of the man but pass him if he comes beneath a heel he shall be crushed until he cannot feel or being callous happily till he can. But he is nothing. Nothing? Only mark the rich light striking out from her on him. Ha! What a sense it is when her eyes swim across the man she singles, leaving dark all else. Lord God, who mads the thing so fair? See that I am drawn to her even now. It cannot be such harm on her cool brow to put a kiss. Yet if I meet him there, but she is mine. Ah, no, I know too well. I claim a star whose light is overcast. I claim a phantom woman in the past. The hour has struck, though I heard not the bell. End of Sonnet 3 Sonnet 4 All other joys of life he strove to warm and magnify and catch them to his lip. But they had suffered shipwreck with the ship, And gazed upon him sallow from the storm. Or if delusion came, t'was but to show, The coming minute mocked the one that went, Cold as a mountain in its star-pitched tent, Stood high philosophy, less friend than foe, Whom self-caged passion from its prison bars Is always watching with a wondering hate, Not till the fire is dying in the grate. Look! Look we for any kinship with the stars. Oh, wisdom never comes when it is gold, and the great price we pay for it full worth. We have it only when we are half earth. Little avails that coinage to the old. End of Sonnet 4 Sonnet 5 A message from her set his brain aflame. A world of household matters filled her mind wherein he saw hypocrisy designed. She treated him as something that is tame, and but at other provocation bites. Familiar was her shoulder in the glass, through the dark rain, yet it may come to pass, that a changed eye finds such familiar sights more keenly tempting than new loveliness. The what has been a moment seemed his own, the splendors, mystery, dear because known, nor less divine, love's inmost sacredness called to him, 
come in his restraining star, eyes nurtured to be looked at, scarce could see a wave of the great waves of destiny, convulsed at a checked impulse of the heart. End of Sonnet 5 End of Section 1 This recording is in the public domain. Section 2 of Modern Love by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Caveat Sonnet 6 through 10 Sonnet 6 It chanced his lips did meet her forehead cool. She had no blush, but slanted down her eye. Shamed nature then confesses love can die, And most she punishes the tender fool, Who will believe what honours her the most. Dead. Is it dead? She has a pulse and flow of tears, the price of blood drops, as I know, for whom the midnight sobs around love's ghost. Since then I heard her, and so will sob on. The love is here, it has but changed its aim. O oh, bitter barren woman, what's the name, the name, the name, the new name thou hast won? Behold me striking the world's coward stroke. That will I not do. Thought the sting is dire. Beneath the surface this, while by the fire they sat, she laughing a quiet joke. End of Sonnet 6 Sonnet 7 She issues radiant from her dressing room, like one prepared to scale an upper sphere. By stirring up a lower, much I fear, how deftly that oiled barber lays his bloom. That long-champed dapper cupid with frisked curls Can make known woman torturingly fair, A gold-eyed serpent dwelling in rich hair, Awakes beneath his magic whisks and twirls, His art can take the eyes from out my head, Until I see with eyes of other men, While deeper knowledge crouches in its den, And sends a spark up, Is it true we are wed? Yea, filthiness of body is most vile, but faithlessness of heart I do hold worse. The former it were no so great a curse to read on the steel mirror of her smile. End of Sonnet 7 Sonnet 8 Yet it was plain she struggled, and that sob of righteous feeling made her pitiful. Poor, poor twisting worm, so queenly beautiful. What came the cleft between us? Who's the fault? My tears are on thee that have rarely dropped, as balm for any bitter wound of mine. My breast will open for thee at a sign, but no, we are two reed pipes coarsely stopped. The god once filled them with his mellow breath, and they were music till he flung them down. Used, used, hear now the discord loving clown, puff his gross spirit in them, worse than death. I do not know myself without thee more. In this unholy battle I grow base, if the same soul be under the same face. Speak, and a taste of that old time restore. End of Sonnet 8 Sonnet 9 He felt the wild beast in him between whiles, so masterfully rude that he would grieve to see the helpless, delicate thing receive his guardianship through certain dark defiles. Had he not teeth to rend and hunger too, but still he spared her once. Have you no fear, he said, t'was dusk, she in his grasp, none near. She laughed, no, surely am I not with you. And uttering that soft starry you, she leaned her gentle body near him, looking up. And from her eyes, as from a poison cup, he drank until the flittering eyelid screamed. Devilish, malignant witch. And, O oh, young being, of heaven's circle glory, hear thy shape, to squeeze like an intoxicating grape. I might, and yet thou goest safe, supreme. End of Sonnet 9 Sonnet 10 But where began the change, and what's my crime? The wretch condemned who has not been arraigned chafes at his sentence. Shall I, unsustained, drag on love's nerveless body through all time? 
I must have slept, since now I wake. Prepare, you lovers, to know love a thing of moods, not like hard life of laws. In love's deep woods I dreamt of loyal life. The offence is there. Love's jealous woods about the sun are curled. At least the sun far brighter there did beam. My crime is that the puppet of a dream I plotted to be worthy of the world. Oh, had I with my darling helped to mince the facts of life, you still had seen me go, with hindwood feather and with forward toe, a much-adored delightful fairy prince. End of Sonnet 10 End of Section 2「Section three of Modern Love by George Meredith, read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano, Sonnets eleven through fifteen. Sonnet eleven Out in the yellow meadows, where the bee hums by us with the honey of spring, and showers of sweet notes from the larks on wing are dropping like a noon dew, wander we. Or is it now? Or was it then? For now, as then, the larks from running rings pour showers. The golden foot of May is on the flowers, and friendly shadows dance upon her brow. What's this? When nature swears there is no change to challenge eyesight. Now, as then, the grace of heaven seems holding earth in its embrace, nor eyes nor heart has she to feel it strange? Look, woman, in the west, There wilt thou see an amber cradle Near the sun's decline, Within it featured even in death divine, Is lying a dead infant slain by thee. End of Sonnet 11 Sonnet 12 Not solely that the future she destroys, and the fair life which in the distance lies, For all men beckoning out from dim, rich skies, Nor that the passing hours supporting joys Have lost the keen-edged flavor which begat Distinction in old times, and still should breed Sweet memory and hope, earth's modest seed, And heaven's high prompting, not that the world is flat, Since that soft, luring creature I embraced, Among the children of illusion went, Methinks with all this loss I were content, If the mad past on which my foot is based Were firm, or might be blotted, But the whole of life is mixed, The mocking past will stay, And if I drink oblivion of a day, so shorten I the stature of my soul. End of Sonnet 12 Sonnet 13 I play for seasons, not eternities, Says nature, laughing on her way. So must all those whose stake is nothing more than dust. And lo, she wins, and of her harmonies, She is full sure, upon her dying rose, she drops a look of fondness, and goes by, Scarce any retrospection in her eye, For she the laws of growth most deeply knows, Whose hands bear here, a seed bag there, an urn, Pledges she herself to aught, twould mark her end, This lesson of our only visible friend, Can we not teach our foolish hearts to learn? Yes, yes! But, oh, our human rose is fair, surpassingly, lose calmly love's great bliss, when the renewed forever of a kiss whirls life within the shower of loosened hair. End of Sonnet 13 Sonnet 14 What soul would bargain for a cure that brings contempt the nobler agony to kill? Rather let me bear on the bitter ill, and strike this rusty bosom with new strings. It seems there is another veering fit, since on the gold-haired lady's eyeballs pure, 
I looked with little prospect of a cure, And while her mouth's red bow loosed shafts of wit, Just heaven, can it be true that jealousy Has decked the woman thus? And does her head swim somewhat for possessions forfeited? Madam, you teach me many things that be. I open an old book, and there I find That women still may love whom they deceive. Such love I prize not, madam, by your leave. The game you play at is not to my mind. End of Sonnet 14 Sonnet 15 I think she sleeps, it must be sleep, when lo, Hangs that abandoned arm toward the floor. The face turned with it, now make fast the door. Slip on, it is your husband, not your foe. The poet's black stage lion of wronged love Frights not our modern dames. Well, if he did, now will I pour new light upon that lid, Full sloping like the breasts beneath, sweet dove. Your sleep is pure, nay pardon, I disturb. I do not? Good. Her waking infant stare Grows woman to the burden my hands bear. Her own handwriting to me, when no curb is left on passion's tongue, she trembles through a woman's tremble. The whole instrument I show another letter lately sent. The words are very like. The name is new. End of sonnet fifteen. End of section three. This recording is in the public domain. Section 4 of Modern Love by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Sonnet 16 through 20 Sonnet 16 In our old shipwreck days there was an hour When, in the firelight, steadily aglow, Joined slackly, we beheld the red chasm grow Among the clicking coals, our library bower that eve was left to us and hushed we sat as lovers to whom time is whispering from sudden open doors we heard them sing the nodding elders mixed good wine with chat well knew we that life's greatest treasure lay with us and of it was our talk ah yes love dies i said i never thought it less she yearned to me that sentence to one say then when the fire domed, blackening, I found her cheek was salt against my kiss, And swift up the sharp scale of sobs her breast did lift, Now am I haunted by that taste, that sound. End of Sonnet 16 Sonnet 17 At dinner she is hostess, I am host. Went the feast ever cheerfuller? She keeps the topic ever intellectual deeps, In buoyancy afloat. They see no ghost, with sparkling surface eyes, Reply the ball. It is in truth a most contagious game, Hiding the skeleton shall be its name. Such play as this the devils might appall, But here's the greater wonder, in that we, Enamored of an acting naught can tire, each other, like true hypocrites, admire. Warm lighted looks, love's ephemero, shoot gaily o'er the dishes and the wine. We wake in envy of our happy lot. Fast, sweet, and golden shows the marriage knot. Dear guests, you now have seen love's corpse light shine. End of Sonnet 17. Sonnet 18. Here Jack and Tom are paired with Moll and Meg, Curved open to the river reach is seen, The country merry-making on the green, Fair space for signal shakings of the leg, That little screwy fiddler from his booth, Once flows one nut-brown stream, commands the joints, Of all who caper here at various points, I have known rustic revels in my youth, the mayfly pleasures of a mind at ease. An early goddess was a country lass. A charmed amphion oak, she tripped the grass. What life was that I lived, the life of these? 
heaven keep them happy nature they seem near they must i think be wiser than i am they have the secret of the bull and lamb tis true that when we trace its source tis beer end of sonnet eighteen sonnet nineteen no state is enviable to the luck alone of some few favored men i would put claim i bleed but her who wounds i will not blame have i not felt her heart as twere my own beat through me could i hurt her heaven and hell that could hurt her cruelly can i let my love's old timepiece to another set swear it can't stop and must forever swell sure that's one way love drifts into the mart where goat-legged buyers throng i see not plain my meaning is it must not be again great god the maddest gambler throws his heart if any state be enviable on earth tis yon born idiots who as days go by still rubs his hands before him like a fly and a queer sort of meditative mirth end of sonnet nineteen sonnet twenty i am not of those miserable males who sniff at vice and daring not to snap who therefore hope for heaven i take the hap of all my deeds the wind that fills my sails propels but i am helmsman am i wrecked i know the devil has sufficient weight to bear i lay it not on him or fate besides he's damned that man i do suspect a coward who would burden the poor deuce with what ensues from his own slipperiness i have just found a wanton scented tress in an old desk dusty for lack of use of days and nights it is demonstrative that like some aged star gleam luridly if for those times i must ask charity have i not any charity to give end of sonnet twenty end of section four Section 5 of Modern Love by George Meredith. Read for LibriVox.org. Sonnets 21 to 25. Sonnet 21. We three are on the cedar shadowed lawn, my friend being third. He who at love once laughed is in the weak rib by a fatal shaft, struck through and tells his passion's bashful dawn and radiant culmination glorious crown when this she said went thus most wondrous she our eyes grow white encountering that we are three forgetful then together we look down but he demands our blessing he is convinced that words of wedded lovers must bring good we question if we dare or if we should and pat him with light laugh we have not winced next she has fallen fainting points the sign to happy things in wedlock when she wakes she looks the star that through the cedar shakes her lost moist hand clings mortally to mine end of sonnet 21 sonnet 22 what made the woman labor to confess? There is about her mouth a nervous twitch. Tis something to be told, or hidden, which? I get a glimpse of hell in this mild guess. She has desires of touch, as if to feel that all the household things are things she knew. She stops before the glass. What sight in view? a face that seems the latest to reveal, for she turns from it hastily and tossed, irresolute steals shadow-like to where I stand and wavering pale before me there. Her tears fall still as oak leaves after frost. She will not speak. I will not ask. We are league sundered by the silent gulf between. You burly lovers on the village green, yours is a lower and a happier star. 
End of Sonnet 22 Sonnet 23 Tis Christmas weather, and a country house Receives us, rooms are full, we can but get An attic crib. Such lovers will not fret, At that it is half said, the great carouse Knocks hard upon the midnight's hollow door. But when I knock at hers, I see the pit. Why did I come here in that dullard fit? I enter and lie couched upon the floor. Passing, I caught the coverlet's quick beat. Come shame burn to my soul, and pride and pain. Foul demons that have tortured me and chain. Out in the freezing darkness the lambs bleat. The small bird stiffens in the low starlight. I know not how, but shuddering as I slept, I dreamed a banished angel to me crept. My feet were nourished on her breasts all night. End of Sonnet 23, Sonnet 24 The misery is greater as I live, To know her flesh so pure, so keen her sense, That she does penance now for no offense, Save against love, the less can I forgive. The less can I forgive, though I adore that cruel, lovely pallor which surrounds her footsteps and the low, vibrating sounds that come on me as from a magic shore. Low are they but most subtle to find out, the shrinking soul. Madam, tis understood when women play upon their womanhood. It means a season gone. And yet I doubt, but I am duped. That nun-like look waylays my fancy, Oh, I do but wait a sign. Pluck out the eyes of pride, Thy mouth to mine? Never, though I die thirsting, Go thy ways. End of Sonnet 24 Sonnet 25 You like not that French novel? Tell me why. You think it quite unnatural? Let us see. The actors are, it seems, the usual three. Husband and wife and lover, she but fie. In England will not hear of it. Edmond, the lover, her devout chagrin doth share. Blancmange and absinthe are his penitent fair. Till his pale aspect makes her overfond. So to preclude fresh sin he tried roast biff. Meantime the husband is no more abused. August forgives her ere the tear is used. Then hangeth all on one tremendous if. If she will choose between them, she does choose. And takes her husband like a proper wife. Unnatural, my dear, these things are life. And life, some think, is worthy of the muse. End of Sonnet 25 End of section 5. This recording is in the public domain. Read by Jeffrey Wilson. Section 6 of Modern Love by George Meredith. Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson. Sonnets 26 to 30. Sonnet 26. Love, ere he bleeds, an eagle in high skies, as earth beneath his wings. From red and eve he views the rosy dawn. In vain they weave the fatal web below, while far he flies. But when the arrow strikes him, there's a change. He moves but in the track of his spent pain, whose red drops are the links of a harsh chain, binding him to the ground with narrow range. A subtle serpent then has love become. I had the eagle in my bosom erst. Henceforward with the serpent I am cursed. I can interpret where the mouth is dumb. Speak and I see the side lie of a truth. Perchance my heart may pardon you this deed. But be no coward. You that made love bleed, you must bear all the venom of his tooth. End of Sonnet 26 Sonnet 27 Distraction is the panacea, sir. 
I hear my oracle of medicine say, Doctor, that same specific yesterday I tried, and the result will not deter a second trial. Is the devil's line of golden hair or raven black composed? And does a cheek like any seashell rosed or clear as widowed sky seem most divine? No matter, so I taste forgetfulness. And if the devil snare me, body and mind, here gratefully I score. He seemed kind, when not a soul would comfort my distress. O sweet new world, in which I rise new made. O lady, once I gave love, now I take. Lady, I must be flattered. Shouldst thou wake the passion of a demon, be not afraid. End of Sonnet 27 Sonnet 28 I must be flattered. The imperious desire speaks out. Lady, I am content to play with you the game of sentiment, and with you enter on paths perilous. But if across your beauty I throw light, to make it threefold, it must be all mine. First secret, then avowed, for I must shine envied. I lessened in my proper sight. Be watchful of your beauty, lady dear. How much hangs on that lamp you cannot tell. Most earnestly I pray you tend it well. And men shall see me as a burning sphere. And men shall mark you eyeing me. And grown to be the god of such a grand sunflower. I feel the promptings of satanic power. While you do homage unto me alone. End of Sonnet 28 Sonnet 29 Am I failing? For no longer can I cast a glory round about this head of gold. Glory she wears, but springing from the mold, not like the consecration of the past. Is my soul beggared? Something more than earth I cry for still. I cannot be at peace in having love upon a mortal lease. I cannot take the woman at her worth. Where is the ancient wealth wherewith I clothed our human nakedness, and could endow with spiritual splendor a white brow that else had grinned at me the fact I loathed? A kiss is but a kiss now, and no wave of a great flood that whirls me to the sea. But as you will, we'll sit contentedly and eat our pot of honey on the grave. End of Sonnet 29 Sonnet 30 What are we first? First animals, and next intelligences at a leap, on whom pale lies the distant shadow of the tomb, and all that draweth on the tomb for text, into which state comes love, the crowning sun, beneath whose light the shadows loses form. We are the lords of life, and life is warm. Intelligence and instinct now are one. But nature says, My children, most they seem when they least know me. Therefore I decree that they shall suffer. Swift doth young love flee, and we stand wakened, shivering from our dream. Then if we study nature we are wise. Thus do the few who live but with the day. The scientific animals are they. Lady, this is my sonnet to your eyes. End of Sonnet 30 End of Section 6 This recording is in the public domain. Section 7 of Modern Love by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Greg Giordano Sonnets 31 35. Sonnet 31. This golden head has wit in it. I live again in a far higher life near her. Some women like a young philosopher, perchance because he is diminutive. For woman's manly god must not exceed proportions of the natural nursing size. Great poets and great sages draw no prize with women 
but the little lapdog breed who can be hugged or on a mantelpiece perched up for adoration these obtain her homage and of this we men are vain of this tis ordered for the world's increase small flattery yet she has that rare gift to beauty common sense i am approved it is not half so nice as being loved and yet i do prefer it what's my drift end of sonnet thirty one sonnet thirty two full faith i have she holds that rarest gift to beauty common sense to see her lie with her fair visage and in inverted sky bloom covered while the under lids uplift would almost wreck the faith but when her mouth can it kiss sweetly sweetly would address the inner me that thirsts for her no less and has so long been languishing in droth i feel that i am matched that i am man one restless corner of my heart or head that holds a dying something never dead still frets though nature giveth all she can it means that woman is not i opine her sex is antidote who seeks the asp for serpent's bites twould call me could i clasp shrieking bacantes with their souls of wine end of sonnet thirty two sonnet thirty three in paris at the louvre there have i seen the sumptuously feathered angel pierce prone lucifer descending looked he fierce showing the fight a fair one too serene the young parasolians did not disarray less willingly their locks of floating silk that suckling mouth of his upon the milk of heaven might still be feasting through the fray o oh, raphael when men the fiend do fight they conquer not upon such easy terms half serpent in the struggle grow these worms and does he grow half human all is right this to my lady in a distant spot upon the theme while mind is mastering clay gross clay invades it if the spy you play my wife read this strange love talk is it not end of sonnet thirty three sonnet thirty four madam would speak with me so now it comes the deluge or the fire she's well she thanks my husbandship our chain on silence clanks time leers between above his twiddling thumbs am i quite well most excellent in health the journals too i diligently peruse vesuvius is expected to give news niagara is no noisier by stealth our eyes dart scrutinizing snakes she's glad i'm happy says her quivering under lip and are not you how can i be take ship for happiness is somewhere to be had nowhere for me her voice is barely heard i am not melted and make no pretence with commonplace i freeze her tongue and sense niagara or vesuvius is deferred end of sonnet thirty four sonnet thirty five it is no vulgar nature i have wived secretive sensitive she takes a wound deep to her soul as if the sense had swooned and not a thought of vengeance had survived no confidence has she but relief has come to one whose suffering is acute oh have a care of natures that are mute they punish you in acts their steps are brief what is she doing what does she demand from providence or me she is not one long to endure this torpidly and shun the drugs that crowd about a woman's hand at forfeits during snow we played and i must kiss her well performed i said then she tis hardly worth the money you agree save her what for to act this wedded lie 
End of Sonnet 35 End of Section 7 This recording is in the public domain. Section 8 of Modern Love by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Larry Wilson Sonnets 36 to 40 Sonnet 36 My lady unto madam makes her bow. The charm of woman is that even while you're probed by them for tears, you yet may smile. Nay, laugh outright, as I have done just now. The interview was gracious. They anoint, to me aside, each other with fine praise. Discriminating compliments they raise, that hits with wondrous aim on the weak point. My lady's nose of nature might complain. It is not fashioned aptly to express her character of large-browed steadfastness. But madam says, therefore she may be vain. Now madam's faulty feature is a glazed and inaccessible eye that has soft fires, wide gates, at love time only. This admires my lady. At the two I stand amazed. End of Sonnet 36 Sonnet 37 Along the garden terrace, under which a purple valley, lighted at its edge by smoky torch flame on the long cloud ledge, where under dropped the chariot, glimmers rich, a quiet company we pace, and wait the dinner bell in predigestive calm. So sweet up violet banks the southern balm breathes round, we care not if the bell be late. Though here and there gray seniors question time in irritable coughings, with slow foot the low rosed moon, the face of music mute, begins among her silent bars to climb. As in and out in silvery dusk we thread, I hear the laugh of madam and discern my lady's heel before me at each turn. Our tragedy is it alive or dead? In the sonnet thirty seven. Sonnet thirty eight. Give to imagination some pure light in human form to fix it, or you shame the devils with that hideous human game. Imagination urging appetite. Thus fallen have earth's greatest gog magogs who dazzle us, whom we cannot revere. Imagination is a charioteer that in default the better drives the hogs. So therefore, my dear lady, let me love. My soul is arrowy to the light in you. You know me that I never can renew the bond that woman broke. What would you have? Tis love or vileness, not a choice between, save petrifaction. What does pity here? She killed a thing, and now it's dead. Tis dear. Oh, when you counsel me, think what you mean. End of Sonnet 38 Sonnet 39 She yields. My lady in her noblest mood has yielded. She my golden-crowned rose, the bride of every sense, more sweet than those who breathe the violet breath of maidenhood. O visage of still music in the sky, soft moon, I feel thy song, my fairest friend. True harmony within can apprehend dumb harmony without. And hark, tis nigh. Belief has struck the note of sound. A gleam of living silver shows me where she shook her long white fingers down the shadowy brook that sings her song, half waking, half in dream. What two come here to mar this heavenly tune? A man is one. The woman bears my name and honor. Their hands touch. Am I still tame? God, what a dancing specter seems the moon. End of Sonnet 39 Sonnet 40 I bade my lady think what she might mean. Know I my meaning, I? Can I love one, and yet be jealous of another? None commits such folly. Terrible love, I ween, has might, even dead, 
half sighing to upheave the lightless seas of selfish amain seas that in a man's heart have no rain to fall and still them peace can i achieve by turning to this fountain source of woe this woman who's to love as fire to wood she breathed the violet breath of maidenhood against my kisses once but i say no the thing is mocked at helplessly afloat i know not what to do whereto i strive the dread that my old love may be alive has seized my nursling new love by the throat end of sonnet forty end of section eight this recording is in the public domain section nine of modern love by george meredith read for LibriVox.org. Sonnets 41 to 45. Sonnet 41. How many a thing which we cast to the ground, when others pick it up, becomes a gem. We grasp at all the wealth it is to them, and by reflected light its worth is found. Yet for us still tis nothing, and that zeal of false appreciation quickly fades. This truth is little known to human shades, how rare from their own instinct tis to feel. They waste the soul with spurious desire that is not the ripe flame upon the bough. We too have taken up a lifeless vow to rob a living passion, dust for fire. Madam is grave and eyes the clock that tells approaching midnight. We have struck despair into two hearts. O oh, look we like a pair who for fresh nuptials joyfully yield all else. End of Sonnet 41 Sonnet 42 I am to follow her. There is much grace in woman when thus bent on martyrdom. They think that dignity of soul may come, perchance, with dignity of body base. But I was taken by that air of cold and statuesque sedateness when she said, I'm going, lit a taper, bowed her head, and went, as with the stride of Pallas bold, fleshly indifference horrible, the hands of time now signal, oh, she's safe from me. Within those secret walls what do I see? Where first she set the taper down she stands, not Pallas, he be shamed, thoughts black as death. Like a stirred pool in sunshine break, her wrists I catch, she faltering as she half resists. You love, love, love? All on an indrawn breath. End of Sonnet 42 Sonnet 43 Mark where the pressing wind shoots javelin-like, its skeleton shadow on the broad-backed wave. Here is a fitting spot to dig love's grave, here where the ponderous breakers plunge and strike, and dart their hissing tongues high up the sand. In hearing of the ocean and in sight of those ribbed wind streaks running into white. If I the death of love had deeply planned, I never could have made it half so sure as by the unblessed kisses which upbraid the full-waked senses, or failing that degrade. Tis morning, but no morning can restore what we have forfeited. I see no sin, the wrong is mixed. In tragic life, God wot, no villain need be. Passions spin the plot. We are betrayed by what is false within. End of Sonnet 43 Sonnet 44 They say that pity in love's service dwells, a porter at the rosy temple's gate. I missed him going, but it is my fate to come upon him now beside his wells, whereby I know that I love's temple leave, and that the purple doors have closed behind. Poor soul, if in the early days unkind, thy power to sting had been but power to grieve, we now might with an equal spirit meet. 
and not be matched like innocence and vice. She for the temple's worship has paid price, and takes the coin of pity as a cheat. She sees through simulation to the bone. What's best in her impels her to the worst. Never, she cries, shall pity soothe love's thirst, or foul hypocrisy for truth atone. End of Sonnet 44 Sonnet 45 It is the season of the sweet wild rose, my lady's emblem in the heart of me. So golden-crowned shines she gloriously, and with that softest dream of blood she glows. Mild as an evening heaven round Hesper bright. I pluck the flower and smell it and revive the time when in her eyes I stood alive. I seem to look upon it out of night. Here's madam stepping hastily. Her whims bid her demand the flower which I let drop. As I proceed, I feel her sharply stop and crush it under heel with trembling limbs. She joins me in a cat-like way and talks of company and even condescends to utter laughing scandal of old friends. These are the summer days and these are walks. End of Sonnet 45 End of Section 9 This recording is in the public domain. Read by Jeffrey Wilson Section 10 of Modern Love by George Meredith Read for LibriVox.org by Alan Mapstone Sonnets 46 to 50 Sonnet 46 At last we parley, we so strangely dumb In such a close communion it befell about the sounding of the matin bell and lo her place was vacant and the hum of loneliness was round me then i rose and my disordered brain did guide my foot to that old wood where our first love salute was interchanged the source of many throes there did i see her not alone i moved toward her and made proffer of my arm she took it simply with no rude alarm and that disturbing shadow passed reproved i felt the pain speech coming and declared my firm belief in her ere she could speak a ghastly morning came into her cheek while with a widening soul on me she stared end of sonnet forty six sonnet forty seven we saw the swallows gathering in the sky and in the osier isle we heard them noise we had not to look back on summer joys or forward to a summer of bright dye but in the largeness of the evening earth our spirits grew as we went side by side the hour became her husband and my bride love that had robbed us so thus blessed our dearth the pilgrims of the year waxed very loud in multitudinous chatterings as the flood full brown came from the west and like pale blood expanded to the upper crimson cloud love that had robbed us of immortal things this little moment mercifully gave where i have seen across the twilight wave the swan sail with her young beneath her wings end of sonnet forty seven sonnet forty eight their sense is with their senses all mixed in destroyed by subtleties these women are more brain o oh lord more brain or we shall mar utterly this fair garden we might win behold i looked for peace and thought it near our inmost hearts had opened each to each we drank the pure daylight of honest speech alas that was the fatal draught i fear for when of my lost lady came the word this woman oh this agony of flesh 
jealous devotion bade her break the mesh that i might seek that other like a bird i do adore the nobleness despise the act she has gone forth i know not where will the hard world my sentence of her share i feel the truth so let the world surmise end of sonnet forty eight sonnet forty nine he found her by the ocean's moaning verge nor any wicked change in her discerned and she believed his old love had returned which was her exultation and her scourge she took his hand and walked with him and seemed the wife he sought though shadow-like and dry she had one terror lest her heart should sigh and tell her loudly she no longer dreamed she dare not say this is my breast look in but there's a strength to help the desperate weak that night he learned how silence best can speak the awful things when pity pleads for sin about the middle of the night her call was heard and he came wandering to the bed now kiss me dear it may be now she said lethe had passed those lips and he knew all end of sonnet forty nine sonnet fifty thus piteously love closed what he begat the union of this ever diverse pair these two were rapid falcons in a snare condemned to do the flitting of the bat lovers beneath the singing sky of may they wandered once clear as the dew on flowers but they fed not on the advancing hours their hearts held cravings for the buried day then each applied to each that fatal knife deep questioning which probes to endless dole ah what a dusty answer gets the soul when hot for certainties in this our life in tragic hints here see what evermore moves dark as yonder midnight ocean's force thundering like ramping hosts of warrior horse to throw that faint thin line upon the shore end of sonnet fifty end of section ten this recording is in the public domain end of modern love by george meredith